So welcome everybody to the um, Nepantla Familias um, panel. And thank you the San Antonio Book Festival for inviting us and especially Clay Smith for, for having us uh, on this great panel with um, Rigoberto Gonzalez and Octavio Quintanilla and Irene Lara Silva. I'm Sergio Troncoso. I'll be the moderator. And um, also I'm the editor of the anthology that just came out from uh, the Whitcliffe Collections and Texas A&M University Press. And so before we get started, I just want to encourage uh, and the audience to, to buy books because it does support the San Antonio Book Festival. And I also want to encourage attendees to place questions in the Q&A box, which we can get to at the end, in the last 10 minutes or so of our broadcast. And, um, and finally, um, I wanted to send a personal thank you to the Whitcliffe Collection for supporting this anthology financially and um, really with, with starting us out and giving me free reign to, to run with, with my ideas on this anthology. So let me talk a little bit about the anthology, and then we're going to start with Octavio. So um, a couple of a years ago, I was approached by Steve Davis of the Whitcliffe Collection. He's the literary curator. And he said, we want you to edit a book for the, for the series. And, and I said, uh, and I asked him, well, what do you want to do? And I said, well, whatever you want to do. So I said, I want to do a, an anthology of new Mexican American literature, literature that for the most part has not been published. And this anthology ended up with 25 of the 30 works published had never been uh, published before. So it's relatively new work. And I wanted to focus on this idea of Nepantla through our familias, through our families. How, and Nepantla really is this liminal existence, a living in between cultures, between languages, between geographies, uh, psychologies even, uh, and even metaphysically, uh, as you'll see in Irene's piece uh, in many ways. Um, and so this, I think, is a fundamental Mexican-American experience. And, and I think it's, it's important to delve deeply into the complexity of identity, not into the simplicity of it. And so that was sort of my idea. And I was also very choosy. I went for writers that I loved, writers that have taught me about my own craft. And, and so I started contacting them and, and saying, I want new work. I don't want, you know, your old stuff. I want your new stuff. And, and I want something written for this particular Theme. And so these people responded, and three of the best ones are right here today. And so, you know, we'll, we'll get started into thinking about Nepantla and how they uh, talked about uh, Nepantla through their families, through growing up, through their fiction, through their poetry, uh, and through their nonfiction as well. So, uh, so let's start with Octavio Quintanilla. Um, Octavio is the author of the poetry collection, If I Go Missing. And with the 2018-2020 Poet Laureate of San Antonio, he holds a PhD from the University of North Texas and teaches literature and creative writing in the MA and MFA program at Our Lady of the Lake University in San Antonio. Octavio? We can't hear you, W. Are you muted? I am. Uh, okay, thank you go ahead. Uh, well, first of all, thank all of you for joining us, and thank you, Sergio, for inviting me to contribute uh, to this beautiful anthology that I suspect is going to be uh, important in, in our uh, literary world. Um, and I want to thank Irene and, and Rigo for, for Rigoberto for being here. And uh, I want to. Uh, I'm gonna. I'm gonna read uh, the two uh, poems that I have in the anthology. And and, and before that, uh, I just want to say that Nepantala. Um, when I think of Nepantala, I always think of of La India Maria's movie Nidia Kini Nidia Ya. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Uh, but Nidia Kini Nidia Ya, not from here, not from there, but from everywhere. And when I think of Nepantala, I think of how it invites us, or invite, it invites me, it forces me uh, to, 
to use imagination to create uh, a new imagination. And I think that's that's where I am with Nepantala. And I think the poems that I'm gonna read speak to uh, not only imagination, but also to uh, an emotional Nepantala, <laughs> you know, where, where you uh, uh, emotionally, you're, you're, you're not here and not there, you're, you're somewhere else and you're trying to create that new space for yourself. Um, and I think the, the speakers in the poems um, uh, try to, to convey that, that uh, duality. Um, and the poems, uh, the first poem that I'm going to read is called uh, You're Tired of Your Life. And uh, it's, uh, it takes place in, in South Texas in the Rio Grande Valley. And, and if you're from that place, uh, if you're from, from La Frontera, uh, you might be familiar with, with this type of narrative, um, this type of Nepantala, uh, where you're still uh, trying to make sense of where you come from and trying to embrace uh, the new place where you're at. You're tired of your life. <clears throat> you're tired of your life, so you buy a small house in South Texas. Before you buy the house, you get arrested for drinking and driving. You go to jail for three days till your older brother finally bails you out. He tells you not to worry, that he knows someone who knows someone who knows someone. Everything will be okay. You won't lose your driver's license. You won't lose your job. It's all about knowing someone who knows more than you. Then you tell him that maybe you shouldn't have bought the house, that you're tired of living the way you do. Divorce was invented for a reason, he tells you, that maybe she'll respect you a hell of a lot more knowing you had the guts to cut her loose, but you're not sure of anything. So you think of the story of your parents falling in love. You have to come from somewhere, right? They have three children, and you're one of them. The third one died as a baby. The times, the two times your mother talked about it, you wondered how a person can live with such sadness and keep it all to themselves. Sadness like an unhealed bone, like a splinter in the iris. But back then, all you wanted was to be alone. So sometimes you'll write yourself into a story as a nine-year-old boy building a tree house. You wanted to tell your parents that you were old enough to leave their town, that their appetite was not big enough to keep them all alive. It was just a thought. You never wrote this down and you never finished the story. The town was small like the heart of a flea. The town was dry like a scab on a knee. And the story you write years later, your older brother bails you out of jail and tells you he knows plenty of people. But it's all about knowing someone who knows someone. For you not to worry. You won't lose your job, he says. You'll keep your driver's license, keep your house. He has no way of knowing that you're, that, that you're still trying to climb out of that tree house. You never finish building. You're still trying to convince yourself to leave your parents' small town. What if you leave and there's no way back? No one there to give you directions. No one there to remember and point a finger at what you wanted to forgive. So that's poem number one, and I have about five minutes, so I think I have time to read one more, the second poem in the anthology. And by the way, I read all the poems in the anthology, um, most of the fiction, most of the nonfiction, and, and they're, they're wonderful. They, they, they all speak to this theme that you set out to, uh, to write about, and, uh, Sergio. Uh, this next poem is called, Why You Never Get in a Fight in Elementary School. In this country, everything about you is foreign. 
and no one likes the look of scarcity. You want to tell them that when you draw a river on a piece of paper, a fish always jumps out of it, and you are always ready to catch it as it leaps out of the page. You are the fish, and yet you're not the fish. You are this, a kid, and the home you knew begins to fill with water. There goes the chair where your father sat to eat his dinner by the light of the kerosene lamp. There goes the only memory you have of your mother's feet. You want to tell them that the ocean where you stand on is not an ocean. It is your new country where your body will be lifted by all the ways of missing someone, lifted by all the sounds. Thank you. Thank you, Octavio. You know, I love your poetry, Octavio, and that's why I took two of them. I, I, I might have taken more, if you <laughs> had more. Uh, just terrific stuff. And um, and by the way, here's uh, one of the first hard copies of Nepantla Familia that I just got in a box uh, a day ago. So our next reader, Irene Lara Silva, is the author of three poetry collections, Puria, Blood Sugar Canto, and Kuikakali, House of Song, and E Chapbook, Enduring Azúcares, as well as a short story collection, Flesh to Bone, which won the Premio Aslan. Irene is currently working on her first novel, Nasi, and a short story collection, The Light of Your Body. Welcome, Irene. Gracias, Sergio, and gracias for inviting me. I'm really happy to be here and glad to be part of the San Antonio Book Festival, even if it's virtual. Um, I've had an amazing time there in the past in person, uh, so it's good to be here with you all today. I wanted to read something from the middle of the story, but then I realized that I'm going to have to do a lot of explaining. So you all are going to get the beginning of the story instead. Mm -hmm. And this is uh, from uh, one of the short stories in the new collection, and it's titled uh, Border as Womb, Emptied of Night and Swallows. Uh, which was inspired by this line of poetry and this incredible poem by, uh, by Rodney Gomez, who's a, a poet also from La Frontera, from uh, Rio Grande Valley. So here we go. I followed you here. I'd follow you anywhere. My father said it wasn't right, that we had it backwards, that it was the woman who was supposed to follow her husband. But that never mattered to me. I'd never do anything that would keep us apart. What I am is yours. I am yours even when you are away, when I am alone. I am yours for as long as I breathe and even after. I am yours for as long as you want me. Memory brought you here, brought us here. Your history is here, your family, your parents and grandparents and great-grandparents, your siblings and nieces and nephews. When we were in Ithaca, all you could talk about was how much you missed them. How much you miss this land and the endless horizons and the wind and the heat and the sunsets and the rose-colored fog in the morning and the sugar cane burning and the river and driving to South Padre Island and the roasted corn and the shaved ice with syrup and el patos and the botanas and the chorizo from San Manuel and the taquitos de trompo served with frijoles a la chara and baked potatoes and the cabrito al carbón on the other side of the border. You missed everything, even the scent of the air and the heat of the nights and the feel of the earth. To you, the Rio Grande Valley wasn't simply a place on a map. The name itself was an incantation, earth and sun and magic all at once. I promised you I'd follow you. To love you is to live here. The palm trees lining the highways and the fruit bearing trees and the orange groves and the mesquites everywhere all whisper your name to me. Most nights when you're at work, I go for long drives. On the freeways where all the lights blur, the access roads when I want to see things pass by more slowly, interstates, state roads, county roads, farm to market roads, connecting one town to the next. Some towns hardly more than a city limit sign, two houses and a gas station. Some nights I turn onto Caliche roads, counting the lights of trailer parks, surprised suddenly by what look like little houses with parking lots and too many cars. Some of them bars without permits, most of them brothels. I sit at truck stop diners, drinking cup after cup of coffee. I have something sweet, pancakes or a pie or cake. Then more coffee until I can bear to go back out again and devour the miles. Windows open and the roads screaming past. 
Everywhere I see roadside descansos, wooden crosses piled with plastic flowers and ribbons and beads, all the tattered and bright colors of someone's grief. Some nights I listen to the radio, and then I'm almost happy. I shout, sing along, doesn't matter what it is, top 40, country music, the songs I remember from the 90s, the cures, the cranberries, new and old tejano, Michael Salgado and Intocable, and all conjuntos, tus relápagos, and los tigres del norte, and los cadetes de Linares looping over and over again. When the whispers began, I tried to outrun them. First on the treadmill, and then at the university track. I tried weights. I tried punching the bag in the garage. I tried drinking at home, and then at the bar down the street, and then at the ice house on the far edge of town. I thought about going across the border to the bars in Reynosa or Progreso, thought about how it wasn't safe anymore. Thought about how, even on good days, it pissed me off to deal with the border patrol and the checkpoints. I didn't grow up like you. I wasn't used to their omnipresence, to the constant questioning of my citizenship. I thought I might take a swing at one of them if I was drunk. So I stayed away from the bridges that would take me across. I stayed on the roads, listened to the wind and the music. I'm always home by the time the sun rises, early enough to shed all of my clothes and warm our bed, and for my eyes to become bleary with sleep before you arrive. I hear your car park in the driveway, hear your keys at the door, hear you make tea and drink it in the kitchen, hear the groan when you take off your shoes, and you sit there for a bit and breathe. And when you come to bed, I greet you with open arms and hold you tight. You tuck your face into my neck and I breathe in the scent of your hair, and you tell me about your day. Sometimes we laugh, sometimes we cry, and we lie there breathing together until the alarm goes off, and I have to leave you, get showered and dressed, go to work. I sleep enough, I guess. I stay awake all day. I sleep on the nights you're home with me. The rest of the time, it's an hour here, an hour there. I start awake, find myself patting my own chest, feel a phantom warmth smaller than the palm of my hand over my heart. Gracias. Wow. Thank you, Irene. That was terrific. Appreciate it. Um, so now to our final reader, um, Rigoberto Gonzalez um, is the author of 17 books of poetry and prose. His awards include the Lenin, Guggenheim, NEA, and U.S. Artist Fellowships. Recipient of the Leonard Marshall Prize from the Poetry Society of America, he is currently distinguished professor and director of the MFA program in creative writing at the Rutgers Newark, um, the State University of New Jersey. Um, and one of the things that his bio doesn't say is really Rigoberto has been one of the leaders of the Mexican American literary community for decades and uh, a personal friend of mine. And so um, that matters in my, in my mind as much as anything else that he's won. Um, so thank you, Rigoberto, for being here. Thank you, Sergio. Um, you know, when, when you approached me about this anthology, you know, I, I said yes immediately for two reasons. One, because I know you don't take no for an answer. And two, because, uh, you know, I have been writing about Familia. I have four books now about the Familia. And I think I, I keep going back to these individuals, to these memories, because the more I examine them, the more complex, the more complicated they become. Uh, and that Interestingly enough, when we when we when they become multidimensional that way, there's we're not we don't get more separated. We actually get more united in a way because there's more questions that we have. There's more curiosities. So I'm glad this anthology is out there. And we you know we had a conversation backstage about why why this, this anthology was needed, and I think it's that because I think that the Latino the Latinx families, the Latinx identities have become monolithic in the conversations and politics and policy. And it's the literature, right, that continues to show that we're individual, we're different, we have commonalities, we share common ground, but we also have uh, different understandings of ourselves and our communities that create conflict and that that's all right. right? Um, so thank you so much for, for the anthology. I'm going to read for, from the last few pages of the nonfiction piece I, I submitted uh, because I think that for right now the the reading the the first 10 pages I think would be a little too triggering uh, and I think that the last 
three, two pages of this uh, essay gave me a sense of um, reconciliation. It's one of the complexities I explore in, in, my, in my literature. That's a, my grandfather was a very complicated figure, uh, very abusive. And so uh, now, you know, now that I'm 40 years away from that period of my life where I lived with him, I'm trying to figure out, you know, is there a way towards him and not continuing to move away from him? I'll, I'll, I will read the ending, and this piece is uh, the Wonder Woman t-shirt. And uh, basically, growing up in, in, in Michoacan, you know, our TV was our TV channel. I always gave the American shows a couple years later, sometimes 10 years later. Uh, so I grew up with the uh, 60s shows in the 70s, and uh, this included, you know, La Mujer Maravilla, Wonder Woman with Linda Carter. The only time I ventured outside was when Abuelo dropped Abuela and me at the Goodwill thrift store. We spent hours rummaging through the bins of clothing, moving items on the crowded display shelves, and poking fun at the eccentric older ladies who walked in and try out hats from another era and coats that looked like fur, but felt thorny like a cactus. I went back and forth between joining Abuela to make comments about the other shoppers and browsing the bookcases at the back of the store packed with mass paperbacks. During one of these visits, I discovered the Wonder Woman t-shirt. Suddenly, I was reminded of my days in Michoacan, sitting with my mother's sisters who giggled and cheered whenever Diana Prince spun and spun until her bun came loose, and after the flash of lightning, when Wonder Woman stood in her skin-tight superhero outfit. A few seconds later, she was bending steel rods or tossing giant crates or lifting cars or leaping from the ground to the top of the building. Invincible and unstoppable, she had arrived to save the world, to save us all. But what really convinced me that this was the version of Wonder Woman that I needed was her picture, slightly turned to the side, ready for battle with her magic lasso looped around her hip, smoke in the background suggesting that she had just completed her transformation from a prim and proper intelligence officer to Amazon warrior. There she was, my childhood idol in black and white, exactly as I had learned to appreciate her in that black and white TV we owned in Michoacan. Can I get this, Abuela? Abuela lifts the bottom of the white t-shirt to inspect the image closely. Who is this woman, she asked. La Mujer Maravilla, I responded. La Mujer Maravilla? Abuela looked at it with this interest for a few more seconds before saying, put it in the cart. I wasn't intending to ever wear the t-shirt. It was more like a memento, a photograph, a small reminder of the happiness I once felt long before I was moved from one country to another, torn away from my mother's family to live with my father's. I must have stored it in a safe place, in a safe place to keep it a secret, so well hidden that I completely forgot about it when a few years later, I moved out of the house for good to enroll at the university. College was yet another new beginning, though this time I was not going to be what the bullies wanted me to be. I was going to be myself. And for 30 years, I managed it. Mine wasn't a smooth journey, but it was mine exclusively. Bad decisions, good decisions, failures, and triumph. I didn't receive much news from home except when somebody passed away. A widow died in 2004, Abuela in 2011. Then one evening, scouring Facebook out of curiosity to see the pictures of the relatives I had left behind decades ago, I came across a photograph of Abuelo and Abuela posing with the youngest son and his two daughters, the eldest almost as tall as Abuelo. Abuela wore one of her aprons, this one pink, but Abuelo stood proudly in my Wonder Woman t-shirt except that he had cut off the sleeves to expose his shoulders and thin biceps. He did this to all of his t-shirts because he believed it made him look manlier. I had expected to feel outraged at the defilement of what, was, of what was once an important connection to a better period of my life, but seeing him looking frail and harmless after all these years awoke a soft spot I didn't know I had inside. It was a kind of tenderness tinged with sympathy and perhaps nostalgia that I'm certain all middle-aged men develop for their adolescence, when everything seemed terrible, but with the passage of time, now it didn't seem as painful as all that. Or maybe 
that was what coming to terms with, with the past did, uh, did to a person. It was closure, letting the wounds heal and arriving at this miraculous new place called forgiveness. Thank you. Thank you, Rigoberto, bravo. Um, so I, I now have a, a few questions for all of you. And you can take turns, you know, each of you can take your, your turn answering it or in your own way. And then after that, we'll turn to any audience questions uh, people have toward the end of our, our, our panel. So when I sometimes think about or hear about Nepantla, this liminal existence in between cultures and languages and countries and identities, I sometimes sense that some see this existence as either a weakness or an indecisiveness or even a confusion, um, especially people who are, let's say, not uh, Mexican-American. But I have often seen Nepantla, or at least how I experienced it, it within my family, and I, I have you know, an essay in the collection as well. I, I've, I've seen this experience as a strength, even a painful gauntlet that forced me to pick and choose who I became. Now, how does Nepantla, as it occurred in your family, a painful trial that in a way was productive to who you became and what you care about? I'll jump in on this. Um, so I thought it was interesting that uh, when Octavio brought up the Nidaquine uh, Aya with the uh, India Maria, it reminded me uh, there's a song that Chavela sings that's also called Nidaquine Aya. And one of the most striking lines in that song is, um, Y ser feliz es mi color de identidad. To be happy is the color of my identity. And I thought that that's such a beautiful line. I mean, just the idea of that. Um, one of the things that people who know me hear me rant on about a lot is that, you know, we, we often see literature and there's this sort of idea that we can't move around um, in Mexican American literature in particular that to be Mexican-American, to be indigenous, to be in Nepantla, um, can only be a wound, can only be the experience of a wound, that there can only be uh, trauma from that existence. And I think one of the things that, that I'm very strongly on the side of is that there is so much positive that can come from that. You know, there is so much um, strength, adaptability, uh, I forget what the term is. There's a, a, a psychological term for not when you have like post-traumatic stress, but when you have a, a positive reaction to um, to opposition and to, to trauma. Um, it, it's sort of a, a growth that happens. Um, and that's so much also of what our experience is, you know, to uh, using, you know, thinking of Antalua, um, what pushes us to transform. Because when we are comfortable, there is little need to transform. When you're not comfortable, then there there is a an imperative to transform. There's an imperative to uh, become other than what you were. And usually that other uh, is stronger and more resilient and more resourceful. And I think it's one of the huge things that pushes us to make art. Um, I have to say, I I was blown away by Daniel Chacon's story. I love that story. And so much about that is, you know, even when you think of victimization and powerlessness and fear and death, how transforming it can be to take your rage and your fear and transform it into art and make it this experience of, I don't even know how to describe what, how that story left me. It gave me chills. It left me in this, um, this blissful, empowered state that I wouldn't have expected from the beginning or the middle or even like the almost to the end of the story. But that what the transformation of art making did was tremendous. Rodrigo or Octavio? Yeah, um, I can go since uh, Irene mentioned a few terms that I, I want to follow up with uh, this idea of transformation. And uh, one of the themes that keeps coming up in the and the anthology is this idea of uh, being torn. You know, we're torn from language, we're torn from country. Even Rigoberto just, you know, used that word right now. Uh, you know, you see it in, uh, in David Romo's uh, essay, you see it in, in your own essay, uh, Sergio. 
Um, and and I think I'm thinking of Nepantla right now that I heard a decade in a talk uh, of and and you posing the question. Uh, I think in in my case it, it's it is pain. It is being torn from everything that you knew. Nonetheless, uh, like I mentioned at the beginning, uh, being in a pantla, it's, uh, it's strength, it's imagination. And one of the things that, that happened was that uh, I'm the oldest of, uh, uh, of six, you know, uh, I have four brothers and a sister. And, uh, you know, when we left Mexico, um, uh, you know, as we got older, you know, that my siblings, you know, we and myself, we would get together to celebrate whatever. Uh, I remember this conversation we had once and we were like, uh, hey, we're so disconnected from from our families in, in Mexico and Monterrey. Uh, and one of my brothers said, yeah, you know, we're beginning a new here. We, we are the, the new, like a new, uh, uh, the, the new roots of, of a new tree, you know, and I, and I like that, you know, because that does not, uh, you know, um, I guess it's not uh, uh, telling us to forget where we come from, but there's this energy that uh, me and my brothers and my sister and our, our families are creating this new thing in, in the United States and a new, uh, uh, a new uh, um, uh, tree, you know, family tree. And my, my father died in 2015, and he's the first person in our family who's been buried here in Texas, in the United States. So, uh, so I think I, I want, I just want to say that, uh, Nepantla, Nepantla, being in Nepantla, you know, it, um, it, it's about renewal too, not just pain and suffering and thinking about that renewal, communion. Uh, uh I, I think the, uh, Irena used the word transformation. You know, you're, you're constantly transforming yourself and, uh, and it's complex and it's beautiful too. I like that, that both Irene and Octavio kind of speak to the, the, um, the positives and the, and the not so positives. I don't want to say negatives because I think the negatives you know, there's a way that we can reimagine them. And I think that's what Nepanta means is reimagining the uh, whatever pulls or whatever um, tears, you know, that we are seem to be experiencing. Because I think it, it's, it's, it's very different, right, for everyone. And my Nepanta with my family also had to do with sexuality, being gay, being the only out gay member. Uh, also, the first one uh, to get an education, that was another form of separation and that really you know that caused a, a, a rift within me and my father uh, but eventually you know it's it was those things that got me to imagine myself in another place in another environment for my own survival and that did not necessarily mean you know uh, disowning my family it, it just meant understanding that self-care at that moment was more important that if i stay with my family with these prejudices with these anxieties about uh, my education, my sexuality, that I was going to end up being quite hurt. Right? So, uh, so I, I like this idea that that we are, you know, we are encompassing all the the binaries, right? We are we are mending them. We are uh, challenging them in in very uh, beautiful ways and very uh, nuanced ways. I think that's what the hopefully you know, the anthology I think is is managing to do that. Uh, bring those conversations out into the open, especially with a new generation of writers especially with the times that we live in, which is another reason I appreciate it. Uh, definitely, you said, you know, new pieces only. It's like, well, yeah, what's, what are, where, are we, where are we in our imaginations at the current moment with everything that we've learned, with the journeys that we are continuing that our ancestors, you know, brought us to. So for me, that, that's a, it's, a, it's an exciting place, actually. Uh, and, and I think that a, a 10 years ago, 20 years ago, to use a word at Bantlai would be a very different context and a very different understanding of it. Because the Pantla was a line in the middle, and you always felt you were caught, trapped, and not necessarily um, in, in a position to to blossom into something more, you know, more complex. Right, and, and I and, and I think, it, like in my mind, this is the time for Nepanta, almost like as a reaffirmation, because I think nobody ever forgets the pain. I certainly don't. Um, 
but but I think there is a point where you say this Mexican American experience is valuable and uh, is who we are, and it has a lot of permutations, and there's not one uh, you know one, one way of, of looking at it. Um, but but for me, it was sort of a, a, a an affirming of a complex identity. Really, if I were to to label it as something, that's what what I would be thinking about. Here's another question for all of you. When we think about identity, too often we think of static entities as if being American was somehow a fixed concept. Yet I see the experience of Nepantla at the heart of what renews and remakes our country. Tell me in what ways you think your experience of Nepantla is redefining and reinvigorating what it means to be part of this country. And why must we always push back against these static definitions of identity? What do you think? I'll start. I mean, well, to answer that last question, we have to push back because if we, we have to reclaim that power, right, within power ourselves. To not push back is to be passive and allow others to define us to shape our experiences, to tell our stories, right? So I think that the pushback as an artist is creating these stories and sharing these stories, right? And disseminating the stories so that, you know, it's our voices that are saying, this is my experience or this is the experience. So that's important. In terms of the, of, uh, of personally, you know, what, how I see myself as being a very active, um, an active element in this redefinition or reimagining, it's, you know, it, it's one of the interesting developments that, that I've seen in my, my students is how they're dealing now with the uh, gender non-binaries, right? And I think it's it's adapting and saying, well, you know what, every, every generation is going to bring something else to the table. And to resist that or to, or to ignore it or to say, well, I'm not really that, you know, I'm not going to participate. I mean, then that's it. Then you're frozen yourself. You you made yourself irrelevant in this in this new era, this new stage. So it's all about listening to what the communities, people in the communities, are saying, what they're what they're thinking, how they're speaking to, about themselves, right? And then engaging with that. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, uh, I kind of got a sense of uh, like. How do we push back against you know uh, American notions of who we are? It's first of all, it's by writing our own stories, you know, coming from our own hand. Uh, and but I also feel that in my work, I'm also pushing back against uh, our Mexican Americanness, you know, our Chicanismo, our, our you know our Mexico, uh, such as machismo. You know, like in the first poem, you know, questioning that. Uh, so it, it's again, we're in Nepantla. We, we're pushing this way, uh, you know, north of the border and, and also south. And I think that's something we can do uh, and that we're doing as, as writers. Uh, you know, like you said, uh, straddling both uh, ways of being. And uh, I, I think that's uh, powerful. Um, <clears throat> I was actually thinking about this the other day when I was making breakfast to the point where I think I started to like scrub the Teflon off the pan because I was just uh, And part of what I was thinking about was that, you know, there's so many narratives that people want to see as dominant. Like when we think of the Mexican American experience, this experience, so many people think, well, it's only an immigrant experience. It's only a recent thing. And it doesn't, it doesn't acknowledge our indigenous roots. It doesn't acknowledge those of us who have been here a very long time. Um, you know, my my parents were born here. Most of my grandparents were born here, but yet my parents spoke Spanish throughout their entire lives. You know, we we ignore the fact that there are very deep Mexican roots. Um, you know, when I, when I would ask my mother, or I wouldn't ask my mother, but when my mother identified who we were, she would say we were Mexicanos de este lado. You know, so that it didn't matter where the border was, where we'd been born. We were Mexicanos, just we were from this side, as opposed to being Mexicanos from that side. Um, so we were still identified as Mexicanos, even though, you know, I, I didn't grow up with any grandparents or anybody to go visit in Mexico. I've never been actually past the border. 
um, they're you know slightly on the other side of the border, um, but that that doesn't impact who we are and who we identify as, or those indigenous roots. And also, there's this whole, you know, my entire life uh, with my skin color and with the fact that I can speak some Spanish. Um, you know, there's people always assume that I'm an immigrant. Even here in Austin, people always assume that I'm an immigrant. Even Mexicanos ask me where I'm from. Um, and it's like we have to change this idea that, you know, we have been here. We are here. And that there's not this sort of capitalist American idea of United States an idea of of, uh, of crumbs, of fighting over crumbs or fighting over each other. My being Mexican-American does not mean that I wouldn't call Mexicanos, you know, my hermanas and hermanos. It wouldn't mean that I wouldn't extend that to people from Central America or South America. It doesn't mean that I, you know, with, you know, with uh, that acceptance of, of being in Texas and acknowledging this is my land, you know, there is no other land that is mine. This is my land that I can't extend that then to others, you know, rather than it being a competition between uh, you know, the Rio Grande Valley, it tends to be very hierarchical. There's just very obvious splits between, well, who's born here and who's born there and whose parents were born here and whose parents were born there, who's dark, who's light skinned, who works outside, who works indoors, who's educated, who's not. All these different splits are part of what the system wants us to do to compete with each other, to um, align against each other rather than to welcome each other which would be the, the more indigenous way of seeing what community is and what family is and who we are to each other. So how do we look at how we can connect to others through our identities rather than how do we isolate ourselves or compete with each other? You know, how do we connect? And over and over again, how do we connect? You know, we have all these debates about Latinx, going back to what Roberto was saying about um, how we see, you know, uh, gender identity. You know, why wouldn't we look for ways to connect even more on the level of race, on the level of ancestry, on the level of, of gender identity, sexuality, um, art, history, politics, you know, what we want to see. And that's part of the pushback. That's part of, you know, not just in art, not just in literature, but in politics and what we want to see for our communities and everything from, you know, health to uh, people at the border to the, our prison system to education reform to all of that is to keep looking for the ways to connect. That's what I think Nepal lies. That's very well put, Irene. And and and, and you know, I when I wrote the intro, one of the things I said is that I think Nepantla fundamentally means empathy. Means that you you because of what you experience, because of the pain you experience, because of what you had to overcome, and maybe are still overcoming as an adult, it, it sensitizes you to, you know, being uh, from los de abajo, you know, uh, when somebody is abused, when somebody is being uh, put down, and whether they're Mexican American or not, it doesn't matter who it is. At least it did for me. And, you know, one of the things uh, that I, you know, it, it would piss me off if you see that abuse happening in front of you. And, um, and so I think this sort of sense of empathy of this happened to me, I can't let it happen to you either, um, is, is, uh, is at the root of this uh, idea of, of, you know, that this experience of Nepantla being creating, uh, I hope, you know, more empathetic uh, selves. Uh, people who are vulnerable but overcame and and did what they could to you know to um, to understand who they were and fit in the way that they could. Let me give you one last question for all of you, um, and and this is for the younger generation. Like, what advice would you give to younger writers or the younger generation in general experiencing their version of Nepantla? Um, and and two parts, like how do you think their experience will be different from what your experience was? And also think about how, what you would say to your younger self, you know, if you could now, um, you know, when you're, when you're young and you're experiencing this and there's a lot of confusion and maybe a lot of uh, attacks, you know, of who you are, the color of your skin, do you belong, um, all these questions. Um, what advice would you give to this younger generation? And some of them may be listening today. Uh, 
Bob, it's your turn to be first. Hmm? Yeah, I was thinking about that. And the first thing that came to, to my mind was uh, Reina Grande's um, uh, nonfiction piece, uh, where uh, she uh, talks about, writes about um, uh, losing her, her, uh, her Spanish, but also how her kids struggle uh at least in, in the in the essay her son in a way uh kind of got mad at her for not following through and teaching her spanish right teaching him spanish and then her daughter uh got the opportunity to to in a you know, bilingual class um biliterate class and her daughter uh can can talk with with her uh, grandmother grandparents um so uh you know what what advice do i give the new generation i think uh, the the advice i give them is to uh definitely embrace um uh where they come from but i think you know i, I you know I, we we're, I feel kind of like I'm the new generation, and I think it's, in a sense, it's my responsibility to teach my children, give them access to to this, to my experience, and to not be ashamed of speaking Spanish, for example, uh, to not be ashamed of of, of um, how they look or the color of their skin or, um, you know, the the the, the culture they embrace. Um, so. I'm thinking about, you know, uh, uh, you know, the second generation born, you know, how, how are they going to experience Nepantla? You know, um, I feel very connected to this idea because I, I experienced it in the literal and theoretical ways that we're talking about, about it. Uh, so, um, I don't know. I, I think, uh, that's my advice right there. Um, you know, if, if, if you are in, if you're part of this generation and you decide to have children, make sure that you, you, uh, <laughs> you introduce them to, to Nepantla and what that means in terms of, uh, you know, the, uh, Nepantla of, 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 uh, culture, Nepantla of race, Nepantla of machismo, Nepantla of, of all those things that affect us now and are going to keep affecting us the more we know about where we come from and and the spaces that we can we can move in because we have this nepantla the the more uh, empowered uh the new generation and ourselves are going to be i don't know if that answers your question but <laughs> it does Let's see if anyone else has another. I'll, I'll just follow it up with. I mean, I, I do. You know, I think that one of the one of the advantages of the new generation is just access to information, right? And think about somebody like you and me, Sergio. When when we actually had our first computers or the internet? I mean, these things were not you know as easily accessible when we were young. Uh, and also, even when I was in college, you know, in the 1990s, the literature that was there was very limited. Right. So thankfully, there's there's a richness, you know, of access not only to uh, information, but also uh, pages where someone can see themselves represented or reflected. Right. These mirrors that we are creating with our with our works. So that's the that's the 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 one advantage. Uh, the other thing is is that I would suggest to find that community, you know, because even if you see yourself in this book or in that poem. Uh, you still want some human connections, some human contact, somebody to be to listen to and to um, listen to, right? So finding that community, and again, you know, the internet has become such a wonderful tool, even for those that seem to be isolated. You know, I'm thinking of if I had the internet when I was <laughs> growing up in that family, I think I might have discovered, you know, the the, the possibilities of um, of being visible much earlier than when I did. I think I don't have, I think I didn't have children uh, because if I did, they would be blowing things up now um, because I would have told them, you know, you are beautiful, you are loved and fight back. Um, I remember when I was in third grade, I threw a desk at this white farm kid 
uh, because he called me a wetback. Uh, I have no idea how I didn't get in trouble for this, but somehow I didn't. And then I went on to tackle him on the football field, and I'm not quite sure what else I did to him, but I was quite angry. Um, <laughs> so there, I think one of the things that, that we need is to, I always go back to this idea of, of, a, of this self-command, adueñate, you know, take ownership of your space. Take ownership of, of who you are and where you are and what you're doing. Um, because you, you have to take that space, you know. Nobody sets you free. You have to set yourself free. And part of that, I think, is to be really critical about what we allow in, you know, to our systems. Not just intellectually, but emotionally and psychologically. And it's hard to do when you're young. Um, but it's one of the things, I think, that we don't stress enough of. You know, are you reading just to see yourself represented, just to see yourself reflected? Or are you reading to see yourself empowered and transformed? You know, I, I, I think we don't think enough, or, or, or a lot of young writers, I don't think, um, I don't see them thinking about what writing is for, or what art is for, or what identity is for. Um, I'm having, with time, I'm getting more and more sensitive to not wanting to read things that only um, highlight powerlessness and hopelessness. I want to see those things that that focus on healing and on transformation and on strength and all these other things. I don't want to just see the same thing reflected over and over again. So I would tell young people, you know, be critical about what you see in the media, in the media and social media. What are you reading? What are you seeing? What are you being told? What are you reading? How how is this affecting you? How is this shaping the way you think? Because we we need to look at how we are shaping ourselves and it's not just our families it's how the world around us and what we seek out how that is shaping us um octavio and i have had this conversation on and off over years this idea of how you become what you are that it's not just what you create as an artist but how you become the person who writes how you become the person who makes art how you become the person that that is these different things that you want to be. And so that would be part of the advice is what, imagine, imagine yourself into your future and then adueñate of it, take ownership of it and become rather than just to make what, you know, it's, it's not this capitalist what you produce, it is what you make of yourself that is what is important. So I mean, I'll I'll try to answer this same the quest, same question. I I have two sons, and um, some of you in Rodrigo knows Aaron and Isaac. Um, and and one of the things I've tried to do is I've tried to to very specifically tell them where I got my values from, so that they connect it all the way to who was most important to me in my life, which was um, my abuelita, Doña Dolores Rivero, uh, my mother's mother who, you know, who when I wanted to quit, you know, in the Ivy League said, Sergio, don't come back with your tail between your legs. Show them who you are. You know, era revolucionaria, uh, peleó con Villa, you know, fought with Francisco Villa. And she didn't know what the hell the Ivy League was, but she knew how to fight. She knew how to defend herself. She knew how to have a backbone. And so I told my sons, exactly, this is where I got these ideas from. This is where I got these values from these Mexican immigrant values that my parents had, and I translated them to, to, you know, to different places beyond the border. And so for my son, it was, as Octavio, you know, and others have pointed it out, first it was getting them to make sure they don't forget their Spanish. Um, and then also getting beyond the psychological issues, because my Spanish is relatively speaking fluent, you know, I lived in El DF for, for one year and, and, and gone back many times. But they were embarrassed because their Spanish should learn Spanish in, in the schools. But I said, don't, don't worry about that. Don't worry about the, you know, this, putting this at, that you're not as, as, um, as, as fluent as me. You're, you're great because Abuelita, you know, my mother, and and others just love that you're making an effort that you actually can read in Spanish, that you're reading Unamuno or you're reading, you know, Isabel Allende in the original. 
Um, and and so also to try to work out that you know the psychological issues of comparison between me and 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 them and tell them don't worry about any of that just and then frankly go beyond spanish go to russian go to german learn another language um push yourself because that's what my mexican immigrant parents taught me to and 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 i think those are great values and and i've always very made a very you know a point to connect these values to where i began because i think people forget that i mean too often you go to a poor place along the border and you feel that you have nothing to learn from them. And that's a, a terrible mistake. Uh, you have a lot to learn from, from, you know, from, from our families, um, whether they were poor or not. Mine happened to be very poor. And so for me, it, that's why I write. That's why I, I, I started writing and why I still write because the, these values, um, have helped me in my life. So, so that's kind of my way of answering that same question, which is, um, you know, try to be sensitive to the, the challenges that they're facing um, because they want to connect, but they're going to connect in a different way to the border, my, you know, my son's generation than I did. You know, I, I, I go in and out, but they had to kind of go in almost as they never lived there, but now they're actually very familiar with it. Uh, anything want to say any any last words before we sign off um, and i'm going to i'm going to give all of you three a chance to to say your piece on the uh, yeah, I just want to follow up with uh, uh with this same question uh this idea of uh once that you know the advice uh as i heard all of you talk i'm thinking of of uh Nepantla and and uh, once you embrace it the question becomes, how do you use it as a tool, as a means, as a weapon even to empower yourself? And I think that's, I think that's, uh, I want to end with that, you know, because I, I, to me, I see it as empowering. Once, once you, you start understanding how you can move in, in all kinds of places and worlds, Nepantla. I wanted to say something in response to what Sergio said. Um, we know when we think about language, um, and I think one of the things we need to think about is that in Nepantla there should be no space for shame. We shouldn't shame each other. Um, we shouldn't be ashamed of where we are at. It's a miracle. I, I did a Facebook post where I ranted about tamales, but you know who cares if we call it a tamal, a tamale, a tamalix, a ta you know whatever it is. It the miracle is that it is still here. That 500 years later we still have these connections. It is a miracle that we survived. It's a miracle that we retain what we retain, whether it's our proper, you know, Castilian Spanish or our Mexican Spanish or upper class Spanish or Tex-Mex or Spanglish or some other weird combination. The fact that we're all here, the fact that we have a connection, even if we can't speak Spanish at all, we I, I believe we need to make a huge concerted, concerted effort to stop shaming each other and to stop feeling ashamed. Nepanla should be the space without shame. Hmm? I love that very much. Or hierarchies, that's the other one. But I think that's, the, that's embedded in that same, same uh, uh, sentiment. Um, I just want to say that, you know, that it's um, these examinations, explorations as artists have been incredible. And I just encourage, you know, especially young people out there to find their way through if it's not this media, the the writing, then another one. There's this, so there's so many ways to to find a place for the self, and so many ways to find themselves at home. So thank you, all three of you, um, Rigoberto Gonzalez, Octavio Quintanilla, and Irene Lara Silva, for for joining us for this great discussion on Nepantla and Nepantla Familias, our new anthology that just came out this month. Please don't forget to buy a copy and support the San Antonio Book Festival and 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 look at this great new work by by these wonderful uh, Mexican American writers. And again, one final thank you to the San Antonio Book Festival and to Clay Smith for inviting us uh, to this program. Hasta luego. <laughs>